All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we are DAO Team 4, and we are going to be presenting on our project, which dealt with water security and access in two rural communities in the state of Puebla, Mexico. Uh, just to present ourselves real quickly, I'm Luke Allen. I'm in the School for Environment and Sustainability. I'm joined by Christian Mackey from the School of Medicine, Francisco Renteria from CES and the Ford School of Public Policy, and Sialing Tang from the School of Public Health and uh, CES as well. Uh, and our advisor, uh, as Margaret mentioned, is Dr. Nancy Love, a professor in the School of Engineering. Our primary client for this project is FXB International, which is an international development NGO with work ongoing in 13 countries. Their focus is on small-scale economic development with supplemental income and targeted infrastructure improvements. Uh, and they have also recently started working in Mexico, where they have partnered with Huconi, uh, who is our second partner for this project. And Huconi's focus is on the social and psychological development of children and adolescents. And they primarily undertake this work in the city of Puebla, uh, but they have also recently started the Ambientes program, uh, where they have started to pilot similar interventions in peri-urban and rural communities that were particularly affected by the 2017 earthquake in Mexico. So the scope of our problem was reported periodic water scarcity and concerns with water quality in rural villages. And we kind of narrowed that into something that we could address maybe in a year. And after initial visits, um, we found that the conflict was more competition between communities for agricultural water use. And also one of our underlying key challenges was that there was like a lack of regional specific information regarding water use and infrastructure quality and governance within the area because a lot of the open data is open to all of the state of Puebla and that might not be relevant to the specific areas we're looking at. So post our pilot interviews in March, we conducted an initial field visit in May where we were able to re build more rapport in person because that was way more effective than Zoom interviews, which there was a lot of internet issues, so it was hard to engage with our our community members. And then we also co-facilitated climate change workshops with our FXB supervisor, Karina, and that also allowed for more interactive experiences with the educadoras, which were women leaders within the community through Huconi. And we were also able to do a radio station interview, which was really fun, and it allowed us to talk to the broader Alpanocan community. So that was great. And we also, in that time, did a broad-based survey completed by community members to understand the water use and intermittency, how you get your water, what are some of the challenges you face, also if you have any cultural or religious relationship with water. And through that visit, too, we were also able to talk with key informants like community water committees and people who are more in charge of water distribution. And all of that led into our main deliverable, was, which was the community needs assessment, which is more of a public health approach as we're entering this community that we know nothing about. We saw how like in the SF project, they had the community needs assessment to build on. So we, in this document, we addressed like all the strengths and limitations of water access and consolidated into like a survey, consolidated the community survey and the open source information and also provided recommendations for next steps. Uh, this is where we undertook this work. These are the communities of San Antonio del Panocan and Santa Cruz Cuarto Matila. Um, I just want to call your attention to two things in this map. Um, the first is that, as you can see, the communities, which are circled in green at the bottom of this map, are some distance from their sources of water, which are the blue dots at the top of the map. Um, al Panocan is about eight kilometers from its water source. Uh, Santa Cruz is about five kilometers from its water source. This is not necessarily particularly unusual, uh, but as Francisco will elaborate on in a second, it has, in the case of these two communities, necessitated some creativity in terms of uh, governance and infrastructure. The second thing you can see here is that while Alpanocan is technically in the state of Puebla, it is very much surrounded by the state of Morelos. It is sort of on an island there. Um, and in fact, its water source is across the state line in the state of Morelos. Um, and this has created a number of uh, policy and governance challenges related to water access for the community of Alpanocan. Thank you, Luke. And move, moving on, we want to share with you some pictures to illustrate what we saw and what the community shared with us during our trip in May. 
when we talked with the president of one of the water committees of Alpanocan, he mentioned that the river had become a river of hoses. And we didn't exactly understand what that meant at first, but it made a lot of sense when we saw it with our, with our own eyes. This is the Amatzinac River, um, which divides the states of Morelos and Puebla and supplies the community of Alpanocan with water. Most of these water lines supply agricultural fields, may, mainly avocado monocultures. What you see here, the steel pipe, is one of two, is one of, two of, of the water lines that supply the 3,000 li people living in Alpanocan. We want to highlight that these lines cross many miles across the forest, farms, and hills, as you can see here. And now the community of Alpanocan struggles with water access. These signs along the river illustrate the tensions between communities and farmers. They say things such as no digging in this area and concession area, no digging. A second challenge that the communities share with us is the deforestation caused by avocado monocultures, visible from, from land and air, but also in their daily lives as they see reduced biodiversity and increased landslides. This was common in both communities, but it is also the main driver of deforestation in several states across Mexico. Santa Cruz uses a similar approach to Alpanocan. However, their water supply com comes from a different stream, and it is decentralized, with over 40 water lines for a population of about 1,500, about half of Alpanocan's population. These are the ponds and wells uh, in the margin of the stream that supplies Santa Cruz. They are made of all sorts of materials, such as stone, wood, and metal. And each line is identified by a number or a name, as we can see here, and maintained by the group of families it serves. Here in our, in our last stop, we have a couple of water storage systems in Santa Cruz. On the left, we, this is a geomembrane pond in an avocado monoculture, and on the right, a water storage tank for fruit trees and flowers. Now we will talk about results. So these photographs do an excellent job of kind of characterizing what the first half of our project was, which was kind of this data finding mission to both um, draw from open source online resources about the region that we are working in, as well as crafting the methodology we were going to use for filling in the gaps when we made our site visit in May. Um, we had originally also planned to do a site visit in August, which had to be canceled due to local COVID conditions. Um, however, we found, <coughs> we found that we had enough to build off of to complete our community needs assessment, which is not just a description of the data around these places, but also an analysis of what that data tells us about the issues in these places. We've touched on a number of those issues, um, and those issues really guided what we wanted to do, which was offer recommendations. Um, we offered a, a host of recommendations on a number of fields. Just a couple to touch on here um, is um, to undertake programs for farmer education, um, to perform physical water contaminant testing, to consider rain catchment infrastructure systems, as well as engaging state and other government um, authorities that were not uh, particularly present, although they had applicability and resources for it. What was important to us in this recommendation um, uh, stage was also drawing from proven and um, accepted examples of um, interventions that had been performed elsewhere in Mexico and globally. Um, and so we provided in our community needs assessment um, all the resources to learn more about each of those things that inspired our recommendations. Looking ahead, we're hoping that this community needs assessment can grow as we learn more about water um, resilience in our, uh, the communities that we engaged in. We're also hoping that our methodology might be applied um, in other communities as we work with it, the our partner organizations are international and growing. Um, and we also hope that this lays a foundation for stakeholders to make investments and um, take opportunities to improve water for the people in Santa Cruz and Apanocan. 
Um, we have a number of acknowledgments that ends up being an entire page in our longer report. Um, so I can't cover all of them here, but we thank everybody who was involved in this project. Hi, uh, besides like the challenges that you found on uh, the water supply, did you find that there was any like informal networks of like water supply? So I know in like in a competitive, comparative perspective, like in Guatemala, some people sell their own water, rainwater, um, like through an, an informal network. Uh, I was wondering if you saw any other types of networks that uh, provided water supply, alter like alternatives. And also, and second part, I know you did your uh, the, the the geographic scope was in rural Mexico, but I'm curious in like in Mexico, a lot of whenever there's like industrialization happening, like with uh, com with companies coming into rural parts of Mexico and building factories, like that takes away water supply. I was wondering if you saw those challenges in this in this particular geographic location. Um, in answer to your first question, we didn't have time to go in depth into the governance arrangements, in part because they differ between the two communities. Um, so Alpanocan has two water lines that each have water committees of community members. Um, there's a president and then there's about 10 other people in various capacities who are involved in that. Um, one of the challenges with that is that it is an uh, unpaid, you know, volunteer role, of course, and so it's hard to get people to take on what's a very controversial and difficult task without being able to compensate them. When we interviewed the president of the Water Association, he basically said, I really don't want to keep doing this, but um, I, <laughs> I feel like I sort of have an obligation and, and people want me to keep doing it. Um, in Santa Cruz, there's a slightly different system where basically community members can introduce new wells that user groups will then be responsible for. Um, and those are connected by a system of uh, hoses, like plastic hoses that go the five kilometers from the wells to the community. Um, and they're responsible for the, the building and the upkeep of those systems. So it's a more um, formalized sort of uh, system, but organized very much at the community level um, rather than sort of through the state. And regarding your second question about uh, water for industrial use, it is definitely a, a huge problem in Mexico and mostly in the north, in north of it. For example, for producing beer, there's a lot of water required. But in this particular case, because the communities are in like right in the, like in the border of the, of the Popocatépetl volcano in, near to Mexico City, there are not many industries there. So there's not that much comp competition. It's mostly competition between communities in that particular region. Yes, hi, uh, thank you for this presentation. I had a question about, well, a couple of questions about water quality. First of all, you know, how was the water quality at the sources and then in, East Africa, when people have periodic access to water, what they do is they store it in their homes. And we've seen there, actually Nancy and I have seen that water quality deteriorates over time as it's stored in the home. And so there are, I know, efforts to try and help people test this and to make sure that they're actually the water is not, there's not a lot of microbial regrowth in it. But so how is it at the source and did you find it, how it, did you test in the homes as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, initially, when we started this project, we were like, all right, we got to test the water. That's the easiest thing to do. But it's extremely expensive. And we talked to a lot of people. And also, like, in the ground, in the communities, there's a lot of other stakeholders in the area already. For us, we did a community assessment because we were new to it. But, and that's why it's one of our recommendations to jumpstart for the next one. Um, but for quality, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. A lot of, for, like, at least... Home usage, a lot of people boil their water, so not a lot of people felt like they, in our survey, um, we only had 30 because of the time frame of only two weeks. Um, no one really said that they got sick from the water um, except for one person, so that 
we were hoping to also do water testing. I'm kind of jumping around, sorry. But um, we were hoping to do water testing in our second visit, like a very simple one. But we weren't able to go to that second. However, there are people there that have water tested, but the, the lab um, kind of got flooded. But they're working on it <laughs> in the area. So we per t personally don't have any statistics on water quality. But it was something that was thought about deeply while we were working on it. One more time. Oh, no, sorry. We've met our five minutes. <laughs> For these particular communities, is that is that something that they're already seeing, like in terms of either drought conditions or more flooding conditions, or is that already something they're experiencing? Uh, our community needs assessment does provide some data on climate change, and there is a pattern of both increasing temperatures and aridification, uh, less rainfall. Um, but the intensity of water shortages that we're seeing is also somewhat disproportionate to those changes. And so um, it would seem that the land use changes, particularly around agricultural intensification and avocado monoculture, um, are having perhaps a greater effect in the short term than just the climate change itself. Now, obviously, as um, climate change accelerates going forward, presumably, that uh, may well change and it may be that that further exacerbates some of the issues um, brought about by agricultural intensification. Um, it should also be said that um, the, the scale of sort of avocado monoculture and agricultural intensification that's occurring around that is, is really quite extreme. Um, people are making quite a lot of money um, off of farming avocados, um, and so um, there's an understandable sort of economic pressure um, for people to intensify in that way. 